Father God, you are such a good God and you've blessed us immensely. But right now, Lord, I just pray that your spirit will just reach every heart here today, every heart who's here in person, every heart that is with us online, so that each heart will hear the message that you want us to hear, that you need for us to hear. Lord, I thank you so much for Jesus. And we cannot focus on him enough. And Lord, I just pray that we will become so Jesus-centered that in all that we do, we will find Jesus there. Oh, Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, i got to admit that as a child, the day after Christmas ranks among the worst days of the year. Now, when I think about my own childhood, I think especially, even though maybe my closet bulged with new toys and my belly bulged with mashed potatoes and cranberry sauce and pumpkin pie. And I'm afraid there's going to be some more of that later today. And while only mere hours removed from the exhilaration of stockings and presents and carols and, and carols sung around my mom's piano, it seemed on this day that we were the farthest day away from Christmas because it is the farthest day away from Christmas we're 364 days away and if it's and if it's a leap year coming then it's 365 days away and let's be honest the anticipation of Christmas is almost always better than the actual day itself. No Christmas day can measure up to our anticipation. Now the films and the pageants and the songs, they're magical until the day after Christmas. The leftovers, they taste just as good the next day, but there's no more magic. There's no more magic left in the gravy or the dressing or the turkey legs. The tofurkey has been reduced to, well, no, there was never magic in tofurkey. What am I, what am I talking about? Sorry, I didn't mean to, to express some gospel truth there. And while some grown-ups rejoice at the end of the holiday, few children do. And I'm just a kid still. You know, we've created a kind of myth when we think of Christmas night. We've imagined a story where all the actors arrive on stage at the very same moment. Because we've got Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus and the shepherds and the wise men, maybe some angels, you know, maybe a drummer boy, and some cattle who insist on lowing. I have no idea what that means, but they're lowing. And according to some of our more gaudy lawn displays, there were other individuals there as well, like Santa, Bart Simpson I've seen, and Mickey Mouse. I've seen them all. What's more, the scene is usually perfectly lit, perfectly posed, and perfectly fit for a drive through nativity. And scripture doesn't say so, but apparently, if the passers by tuned into the right radio station, they would be treated to a perfectly choreographed music and light show. Truth be told, the birth of Jesus was nothing like that. It was likely dark, dank, 
and maybe even a little dreadful. I love this picture right here. The cattle may have been lowing, but they were also flatulating and worse. Because they were cattle. And the shepherds did arrive to see the child that night, according to Luke's gospel. But the wise men, or the magi, likely didn't show up until sometime between two weeks and two years later. And there's no evidence whatsoever that there were visible angels at the manger scene. And I know this comes as a, a, a maybe devastating to some, but as far as we know, there were no little boys pounding on drums. You know, you know that cute little line about the little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes? Call me a skeptic on that one. He probably cried. He probably pooped. He probably peed and he probably spit up. And that was just day one. That was just what we think of as Christmas. Because then came the next day. And the day after. And then the next day. And the next day. And the next day. The exhilaration or, or maybe relief of the moment may have lightened the load a little. Or at least brightened the night temporarily. But then, as all parents understand, there is this thing that follows called life. Sleepless nights, sleepy days, postpartum depression, diaper rash, ear infections, colic, first steps, first falls, incoming teeth, nagging advice from mom and mom-in-law, and grandparents who fill them up with sugar and then send them home. Sorry, that's just going to be us. Just warning. Surely the other kids would have noticed that Jesus was different. Or maybe even made fun of him. As kids often do. And dad probably would have taught him how to make things with his hands. Or just how to make a living. How to remove the painful slivers. And always those first nights sustained Mary and kept her going, kept her believing. Luke 2 tells us that Mary treasured up these things in her heart. That's a good thing. Because what lay ahead for her would prove more difficult than she could have imagined. The faith of Mary astounds me. Now, when the wedding's wine ran dry, she essentially told her son, fix this. And when Jesus answered, it's not my time yet, she simply told the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. In other words, Mary was like your typical mother, only she was telling the king of the universe, do something anything because I said so. Mary's faith came from somewhere. The place, or the, maybe that same place that faith comes for us. And it was a gift. We call that gift grace. But did it also maybe come from the things that she treasured in her heart? I'd like to believe it only grew as she watched her remarkable boy grow into a man. A man like no other man. And that's a good thing, by the way. Because what lay ahead for her would prove more difficult than she would have imagined. We don't see her often in the gospel story. Mary, that is. But when she does appear, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, she's not always perfectly helpful. Yet, I find it most remarkable that she was there at her son's crucifixion. I doubt many mothers endured such a thing, I mean, attending their son's crucifixion. For one, 
Who could bear the sight of it? Right? Her son, whom wise men had come with gold and frankincense and myrrh. There he was tacked onto a cross like a butterfly pinned to the wall. Who could suffer the sounds of it? Or the ghoulishness of it? Or the shame of it? Perhaps only one who had seen the boy Jesus grow each day in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. I believe that teenage girl in Bethlehem could not have borne that. But the older mother could. The mature woman who was only just coming to grasp what Jesus was born to do that night. To live like no other so he could die like no other. Most who died in the manner that Jesus died probably had already long since been abandoned by family. But not so Jesus, which is a testament both to Mary and to Jesus. We know almost nothing of Jesus' childhood, his adolescence, other than maybe a brief cameo he makes in the temple, stumping the priests and the law professors. We know only a little about even his relationship with his mother. But in one slight moment, we do catch a glimpse. It's the moment when Jesus, in one final gasping breath, arranged for his mother to be cared for by one of his closest friends, John. The John agreed is a testament to John, but also to Jesus. And that Mary trusted uh, Jesus' judgment, even in this moment, is a testament to Mary and to Jesus. Jesus hung on that Roman instrument of torture, stripped of all dignity, honor, skin, and Mary remained close by. No doubt Mary heard him cry out, It is done. Did Mary treasure these things in her heart? This is, of course, a scene from a film I think is a work of incredible genius, uh, Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ. But did she treasure these things? Just as she treasured visits from the shepherds and the wise men? I doubt she would ever forget these things, but treasured? I doubt it. Did Mary fully grasp the monumental importance of the moment? I don't know, but I doubt that too. No more than she fully grasped the implication of the manger, the swaddling clothes, or the flight to Egypt even. But I believe in time she would. When death couldn't pin her boy to the grave, she must have begun to see how that journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem, the birth, the manger, the swaddling clothes, the shepherds, the wise men, all of that was just the beginning. Just the beginning of an outrageous and remarkable plan. Yet even she may not have really grasped the gravity of the plan. How she was witness to a great invasion. A premeditated strike in the midst of a galactic war. Years later, her caretaker, the disciple John, would probably have understood this. You see, even then, only at the end of his life would he truly see in his apocalyptic vision the enormity of the fight. How there had been war in heaven between Michael and the dragon. And the dragon was defeated, but not without a dreadful price. A third of the stars of heaven were thrust to the earth. And the war raged on. And into the heart of this war, Jesus had come. Into this war, the dragon raged. Allow me some imaginative license here. If not some creative interpretation of prophecy 
but years later when John took down his terrifying vision. And there are places where this vision is terrifying. No matter the meaning of this one horrifying picture, John must have thought of his adopted mother when he saw the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that when she did give birth, he might devour her child. But she gave birth to a son, a male who was going to shepherd all the nations with an iron scepter. I believe that we're celebrating how God stormed the beaches of this dark world and Mary's uterus at Kerrigan. God had walked and taught and slept and breathed behind enemy lines and Mary helped to prepare him. God had taken the cosmic fight directly to the dragon himself in an obscure wilderness, on a temple roof, on a mountaintop, and later in a garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. And all the people on earth, and of all the people on, on earth, only Mary saw and heard both the newborn cries and coos of the great invasion, but also the final cry of it is done. And in those words, her son was announcing the field is won. There, on the place called the skull, Mary's boy planted a flag of victory. And Mary got to see it from the beginning of the invasion to the end. Christmas is a beautiful thing. You know I love it. But only if it's seen as a chapter of a great war that had been raging already. And as a pivotal moment in that war, the invasion. Celebrating Christmas without thinking on the life and the death and the life of Jesus. It's like cheering the starting lineup of the World Series and then ignoring the game. Celebrating the birth of Christ without the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, it's like ringing the bell before a great fight and then never knowing the outcome. It's like recounting the storming of Normandy without the long and difficult march through France, into Germany, to Munich and Berlin. Now, I personally plan to celebrate Christmas all weekend long. I love Christmas. And if you know me and Michelle, we probably are gonna celebrate for longer than that. But I wanna ask of you to join me as well in celebrating not merely the birth of Jesus, but the life of Jesus, and the teachings of Jesus, and the sacrifice of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus, and the sight of Jesus in that remarkable throne room in Revelation that we talked about this morning for those who are in the Sabbath school. I plan to celebrate that victory that is yours and mine because of Jesus. Now as for Mary, the victory is hers not because she gave birth to Jesus. The victory is hers not because she suffered the sight of his death. The victory is hers for the same reason that the victory is ours. Simply because of the enormous grace of Jesus. Is Jesus is the wonderful counselor. He's the mighty God. He's the everlasting father. He's the prince of peace who conquered sin and death and now extends that victory to us. Such an invasion. Let's celebrate the invasion. But let's also celebrate the God who said it is done. Father God, may we not lose sight of what a monumental gift it is that Jesus came into this world 
He came in slipping behind enemy lines so that he could confront the dragon himself and take him on and defeat him and then die on our behalf and therefore claim us as his own. Lord, I pray that we, that we will acknowledge him as our Savior. Lord, I pray that every person within the sound of my voice will acknowledge that Jesus is his or her Savior, that he is God, and that he loves each one of us, and that we will claim the grace that he extends through faith. Father, we know that the invasion didn't end and the fight didn't end there in Bethlehem, but it continued. And even now, he's claiming prisoners of war, bringing them back to himself. Lord, I pray that we can be used by you to bring those prisoners of war back to Jesus because he's won the war. He's won the fight. That's what we celebrate. And I pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.